There we go. Um, just talk a little bit about microservices workflow, sort of what happens. Uh, microservices are essential to the, uh, the operation of, uh, of modern island doors. Um, I actually just give you a little bit of background. My name is Alan Stanley. I have been working on this stack for about 10 years now. Started out at the uh, Robertson Library for the, uh, for the grant. Uh, so we're coming in at the end of five. We worked on six, seven, uh, and now eight. Um, so I was at the, I've been at the library a couple of times. I did some work with DGI, um, working with uh, Agile Humanities, as well as doing some work on my own. So fairly familiar with the stack, uh, but we're kind of past the point, I think, with Islandora that anybody can understand the entire stock completely top to bottom. We just grab the sections we need to work on and we think about those. Uh, so the, I'll be talking a little bit about the, uh, the general workflow today. Now this will be, I'm trying to pitch this kind of in the middle. There'll be, uh, there'll be some information that's primarily of interest to programmers here and some to the front end people, but it'll give you some concept of exactly what's happening with a microservice. So what is a microservice? Danny talked about this a little bit. Um, the textbook definition is a series of small specialized programs, each of which communicates with Drupal Island or across a common interface, usually, but not always HTTP. Um, so these are primarily single function things, uh, little programs that will do one thing and hopefully do it quite well. So it's going to change your audio file, change your video file. Uh, and sometimes it only does it one particular way. Sometimes you fire arguments along to have it uh, done in different ways. Uh, so for instance, the, um, the graphics manipulator from the same image uh, might create a thumbnail for you, might create a preservation master, uh, depending on what uh, arguments you pass along, it's gonna give you slightly different results. Sorry, this is not working yet. So it works on any server. Uh, so a microservice can exist on the uh, on localhost. It can exist on the same server that you have your Drupal on, the same that you have your Fedora on, if they're not the same, or any other server. And in fact, there's absolutely no reason on earth that a powerful microservice can't be shared by a number of installations. It's just, you fire it out to, uh, to an endpoint uh, at the end of the queue, and it honestly doesn't matter where it lives. Uh, and it can be in any language. We tend to write ours in uh, originally in Silex, which has been deprecated, now moving everything over to Symfony. Uh, and it's the way we have done it, but we could do it in Java, we could do it in COBOL, we could do it in any language at all. So it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, so for our current microservices, uh, we manipulate audio, video, images, we create thumbnails, we extract fits, we do text extractions, uh, and thanks to a couple of pretty elegant modules from uh, Mark Jordan, we do fixity checks and bagit integration as well. So what we're going to talk about is the life cycle of a request, uh, sort of from cradle to grave, what kicks it off and when we know we're done. So we start with a request to the microservice. So we say, please do this for me. The request gets queued, it gets dispatched, uh, to the microservice. Uh, if everything goes well, we get a response back from that microservice. Uh, and then once we get it, we do something with it. Uh, so we attach it to a node, we attach it to a media, we transmogrify it in some interesting way, uh, but we get that derivative back and it's up to us to do something with it. So when we talk about the request going out, there's four normal stages to that. There's exception I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so you define an action and the action is defined in the code. Uh, so this is something that you will do with a, a plugin. This is something that uh, a developer has to do. Uh, and then that goes into the code base. Uh, and it's got, um, again, we'll talk a little bit more detail about that in a second. The action is instantiated uh, through the front end, which means that once the action is written, it's, you can think of it as a, as a class. Uh, and then you can think of the action as an instantiation of that. So we allow you to create something on your Drupal site that has to be done through the front end, um, but the, uh, the back end part is done in code. Uh, then we define a context. Uh, there's, uh, there's an excellent chance that that context is gonna exist already. And then you define the conditions under which that context is triggered. 
So the actions created in code, and this is, this is the fun part. Uh, so you pass along exactly these six parameters to the, uh, to the carafe queue, or to the, uh, the camel queue. So you have an event, which is typically going to be creation of a media uh, or a, uh, of a node. Uh, you, you have optional arguments that you can pass along. And again, these things can all be defined in code and they can all be overwritten in the instantiation of that that's done through the, uh, the Drupal user's interface. We have a source URI, which tells us which asset we're going to manipulate. Uh, then we have the destination URI and the destination URI is actually really important. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Uh, the file upload URI tells Carafe where to put the changed file. So that's gonna exist as a file on your system, but it's not connected to nodes, it's not connected to media until we do something about that. And then the MIME type is just the MIME type uh, that's going to be returned. Uh, and if the wrong MIME type is returned, it will be rejected. So what makes the destination URI interesting is that the entire process happens in little chunks that don't really communicate with each other. So a request goes out to the queue, and as far as Drupal is concerned, it's forgotten all about it right then. So we need some way of bringing information back when it arrives, uh, when it's been round tripped, that lets us know uh, what we want to do with that. Uh, so let me just, yeah, so here's, uh, here's something from the route. So when we create a route, we will create the destination URL. Uh, and that will, uh, that will tell Drupal a bunch of interesting stuff. Uh, the, the obvious one is going to tell us which controller that we want to handle the incoming request. But we can also put little bits of information in that URL. So you can see in the example here, we've got a media. So now we know what media that we want to work with. Uh, this is the, uh, the route that I wrote for the text extraction uh, for the media. So when it comes back, we have a couple of different things we want to do with it. We want to bring back a file that we'll treat as an original file, but we also want to have a destination text field attached to our media. Uh, and that can be edited uh, while the file is not. Uh, it can be indexed, it can be searched. So it gives us a number of advantages. So we have different things that we want to do with this that we wouldn't necessarily want to do with another derivative. And we have specific information like the field in the media, and uh, that we want to hold the file and the field that we want to hold the text. We can specify that in the URL and then we, when we write our controller, we have that information and we know exactly what to do with it. So this is, uh, this is just an example. There's a, there's a ton of them in the code that you can, uh, you can look through at your leisure. Uh, to instantiate the action, we go into admin, config, systems, action, and there you will see a list of every action which has been uh, defined in code, it's read from the plugins. Uh, so you set up your action at that point and you configure it the way you want to configure it. The most notable thing you're going to do there, uh, if, if it hasn't been predefined, is you're going to give it a queue name. Uh, and the queue name can be whatever you want, but you, uh, you have to remember that name. And that also has to go into code uh, in the graph. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and it's one of the one of the things that slows us down a little bit with microservices, something I would like to see developed a little bit further, is some way of not having to understand everything that's going on under the covers uh, in order to make things happen from the front end. Uh, so you can, you can put in whatever queue you like through the administrative interface, but if Carafe doesn't know about that, then nothing's gonna happen. Uh, then you're going to define a condition uh, there's an ex uh, conditions are defined through plugins in your code. Uh, there's an excellent chance that the condition you want has already been defined somewhere. You can see a list of those when you go into context. And you can pick by mind type, by the parental content type, size, taxonomy, collection membership, what bundle it is. Uh, you can write whatever you like and these get stacked up. So you can come up with some pretty specific context to make this all happen. Uh, then you define the context again through the front end. You go in through admin, structure, and context. You'll have a list. Uh, you will pick under what conditions you want this to run, and you can stack them up. So you can say, I want condition A plus condition B as long as condition C is specifically not met. So you can be pretty granular about this. Uh, so this is, this is up to you to pick. There's uh, 
I've worked on this stack for quite a while. I think I've written exactly one, con no, two conditions uh, that weren't there already. So we're, we're pretty well covered. Danny and, and crew did an excellent job on this to begin with. So most of the conditions you want are already going to be there. Then the request is queued. Uh, so once, the, uh, once these conditions have been met, uh, so typically it's gonna be the ingest of, uh, of a, a, either a content or a media attached to that content. Uh, and then conditions are spun off and the derivatives are created. Um, and very often you're gonna have a series. So one event is gonna trigger, uh, trigger four or five different microservices. Uh, the request is dispatched. Uh, once it goes out, uh, then uh, you have to be configured for that under uh, opt craft deploy. There's a number of blueprint files there. If you are working on the front end, this has probably already been done and you don't have to think about it. If you've just written your own microservice, you're going to have to give it a queue. Uh, so you're going you're gonna to copy from the, uh, the blueprint XML. Easiest thing to do is grab a current one uh, and just change the values you need. So the three important things you have to remember here are the, uh, the name of the uh, persistent ID, and we use Java naming conventions for that, and it just has to be unique. It can be anything at all, but it has to be unique. Then we give it the active MQQ. Uh, in this particular example, it's Islandora connector fits, and it doesn't matter what it is. It can be anything at all. It can be completely arbitrary. It can be the name of one of Melissa's numerous cats. Uh, but it has to be the same one that you've defined previously in your action so it knows where to go. Then you tell it what to do with it. And this is the, this is the important one here. Sorry, it's, uh, where are we? There we go. Um, uh, this is where it tells it where to go. So, uh, and this has to be set up by somebody with access to the server. This is a uh, assisted men's job. This can't be done through the front end. Uh, but it specifies where we're going to fire off uh, that request. So in this case, it goes to Crayfits, which we have on localhost. Could be Crayfits anyplace else. Uh, it could be any other microservice. So we're not going to talk about how microservices are created specifically here, uh, but we're going to accept that the microservice exists and this is what fires it off to. Uh, and at that point, uh, we're done. So then the microservice is going to receive a request object it's going to get the asset from the request parameters, and then it applies the internal logic of the microservice, whatever that is. Most microservices have a single function, possibly two, uh, but they're very simple. It's going to be take this, get the asset, do something with it, create that derivative, and then fire that derivative back to the Carafe queue. Keeping an eye on time. Once the response is returned, uh, Carafe now has the object which has that file. It's going to save the file to the uh, wherever we've specified in the file upload URI, but it's not attached to anything now. It is just a straight up uh, Drupal file object. Uh, and that can be, we might, uh, thanks to Fly System, uh, we can store that in Fedora, we can store that on Drupal, we can store it in the cloud. Um, it's wherever that URI points. Uh, but then we get the request goes to the specified destination URI. And this is where all the stuff we were talking about before comes into play. It's going to come in. It has, uh, it has access, uh, it has access to, uh, the file. It has access to the file location, uh, and then whatever other parameters you've included. So it might be the node ID, it might be the media ID, but it will also contain those additional parameters, if any. Uh, so what this comes from is an example that we hope to pull into core soon. It's something I've been working on for a while, uh, where each media can contain multiple files treated in different ways. Uh, so obviously if it comes in and we're going to attach something to a file, we have to know where to attach it. So we played around a little bit with the idea of using naming conventions and that just turned into a nightmare we didn't want to deal with. So it's much easier to have default spots uh, and then be able to specify those in the URL so you can design your own media types, you can design your own content types, and then with the appropriate design of the, uh, the right context and the right actions, uh, you can make whatever you like happen when it comes back. So at this point, uh, Sorry, let me just click this. Um, yeah, so at this point, we've round-tripped it. So 
uh, kind of in a nutshell, uh, we've created that action. We've instantiated that action. We've created a contact with conditions. We've created the context under which that is fired. Uh, when those conditions are met, the asset is taken and it's fired off to a microservice. The microservice will check credentials. It'll make sure that it's valid. It'll make sure that you have a right to be there. Uh, then it will create that derivative all in its own good time. Uh, and it will fire that back to Caraf, and then uh, Caraf will take that and fire it back to Drupal. And Drupal at that point will do whatever you want. It will attach, it will create a media, or it will attach a file to a media, or it will do something else entirely. So, uh, like, I've got a second to talk about this, I guess. Uh, so, the quick example is it's not ready for prime time yet, uh, but I've written a logging service that will track kind of every stage of development on this. So as soon as the request is fired off, it will log that the, uh, the request has been made. So we're, we're asking this to go off to a microservice. Uh, then when it arrives back, uh, there's a, um, actually let me flip back here. Uh, it's something that's, now we'll bother. Uh, something that's contained, there's, uh, your controller will have a, a, an authentication system deciding whether you have the rights to, uh, to do what you want to do. Uh, so the logging service would check in at that point and say, this request has been received and it either got the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And then we'll say the controller got it, either thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, and then the controller finished doing what it wanted to do. So it can say, we actually got the asset. Uh, but we couldn't do what we wanted to do because this is what went, went wrong with it. So we can create an error message. But the trouble with all this is when something arrives to the controller, you have no idea what caused that. Uh, we know it was a microservice. We don't know who kicked it off. We don't know when it was kicked off. We don't know if it was successful or failure. So we need some way of tracking that at every stage along the way. So what I did was I wrote a little controller uh, with a job ID that wrote it to a database that job ID gets stuck in the URL that travels the whole way along. So even though it's not reporting back directly, it is something that your system can be aware of. So just kind of a quick and dirty example of how we can do that. Um, so I've got like uh, about a minute and a half. If anybody has any questions, this would be a good time to bring it up. The, the first thing that's been requested a couple of times is can you post a link to your slides, Alan? Oh, sure. I'll stick that up there uh, as soon as this is over. I'll, uh, I'll stick it in the chat window. Excellent. And then one question. I see that Action is a Drupal module and it looks like this uses that. Was that module modified to make Actions work for Island Aura? Nope. This is, uh, this is straight out of the box stuff. It's, uh, it works spectacularly well. Uh, so the, we write our own plugins for that. Uh, and I've written a bunch of them, and uh, Danny and crew have a bunch of them. Uh, if you just look through actions uh, through the code base, you can uh, you can get some idea of what's going on. They all extend a base class, which uh, which works off uh, which works off an event, uh, and you can get a fairly good idea of what's going on there. The by, I I can't recommend this enough. The easiest way to do this by far is to set up line by line debugging in your uh, in your uh, development environment. You can see exactly what's going on. Uh, and you'll get pretty good error messages when you've done something wrong uh, that will let you know what information is there that shouldn't be there or what information uh, is missing that ought to be there. Uh, the other thing I'd mention when you're debugging this is if you go into opt bin, opt carafe bin client and run the client, uh, you can tail the logs and you can see exactly what's going on from the graph point of view. All right, so with an eye for the time, I'll have to ask that if anybody has any other questions for Alan, they can put them in the chat and maybe he can answer there because we need to move on to our next session.